My name is Katie Friedman and I work in the Career Development Center and I have my colleagues Dee and Alex joining us today and the three of us will be facilitating this session. We also have two alum joining us, Tim and Laura, um, who will give a further introduction in a little bit. Um, but we appreciate you joining us today and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format. So the format that we're going to work through today is um, Dee is going to go ahead and introduce our two guests and tell you a little bit about them. We then have some questions that we're going to throw their way um, so they can share their experiences and stories. And then we will open it up um, to any questions that you may have. If you have questions during the time, feel free to type them into the chat, either to Katie Friedman directly um, or to everyone. Um, and I will kind of curate what's coming in so we can make sure those are asked um, throughout. And then um, if you are joining this session and you do need a passport compass or connect point, we will be looking at the usage report at the end of the session um, in comparison to the registration form. So do make sure you join us to the end um, if that's something that you're looking for. But we appreciate everyone joining us today and I'm gonna turn it over to Dee who will get us started. Sure. Um, welcome to our, um, I'm Dee Kaler. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Career Engagement. Wonderful to have you all joining us today. Um, a special thanks and welcome to Tim Denton and Laura Nunn. Um, Tim Denton, um, he's a native of LA. He started his career in 2008 after graduating from USC with a degree in business administration. Um, as a managing director at Capstone Partners Financial in Newport Beach, he offers total financial needs analysis, including services in retirement analysis, estate strategies, employee benefit retention services, and business continuation strategies. Tim has also repeatedly hosted USD students on our Toro Track program that takes our students to companies and various industries and allows them to network with USD alumni. We also have with us today, Laura Nunn, as the San Diego Housing Federation's Director of Policy and Programs, Laura plans, directs, and coordinate, coordinates development of policy positions as well as government and legislative affairs. Previously, she's worked as, uh, at U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein's San Diego District Office, working on federal issues related to housing, health, veteran affairs, and social programs. She's also um, interned at former California State Senator Denise DeShaney's office. Laura holds a Master's of Arts in International Relations from USD and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Spanish from SDSU. Um, now, entering the workplace in 2008 has presented different challenges and opportunities for both our presenters, and we're grateful to them for looking back on those experiences as a way to educate and mentor our students and our new graduates. Um, so I'll go ahead and get us started on, our, on the first question. Uh, could you both please share how your USD degree has prepared you for your current careers? Sure, I'll go ahead and, uh, and take that one, Dee. Um, you know, I graduated with a degree in business administration from the um, undergrad business program. And, you know, what I really learned and have carried through to today was one, I took an investment course and then two, um, I also took a marketing course. And marketing um, is very interesting in terms of how it's related to my business and I think how it's related to all different businesses. One of the things that I first learned and I remembered was how to use a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you know that's a question that I am continually asking to my clients and my prospective clients for what they see for themselves. I think it's very interesting to know what their um, analysis is from their seat. And then I'll do the same thing for mine and then we'll collaborate and then um, go from there. So I think it's a very powerful you know, opportunity to start just a conversation with where they see opportunities and where they have challenges. And then I'll be able to also voice what my opinions are later on down the road. But that's definitely something that I took away from my classes and coursework at USD. Thank you for that. Uh, Laura, is there, um, would you like to also share how USD has prepared you for your current work? Sure, yeah. Um, so I got my master's degree in international relations, and, uh, and now I work in a field that's very much focused on domestic issues at the state and local level. Um, and, you know, I think just having that perspective of being able to look at examples from other parts of the world to address the challenges that we're trying to address here locally and in California um, 
has been really helpful and just being able to understand the different structures that exist around the world, what works and what doesn't. Um, and when we're talking about, I specifically work on, on housing policy, um, which is a, is a big issue here in San Diego and California and you know, across the, the country. Um, and it's also an issue that, is, that governments in, in other countries are dealing with. Um, and we can look at what they're you know, trying out and trying on for size and see whether or not it's something that maybe we want to think about doing here. Um, so having that international perspective and bringing it to the local level has been really helpful um, in, in the work that I currently do. Thank you. I have the next question. Uh, can you please give your perspective on how the current COVID-19 economic crisis compares to the 2008-2009 recession? Sure. Maybe the financial expert should take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so look, I think uh, in 2008 and 2009, you know, for, for better or for worse, that was a, a recession that was unprecedented and really set the, um, set the tone for something that we had never seen before. So unlike other recessions, this one was a deep recession. Unemployment was really, really high and businesses really struggled. And I think that was a learning lesson for many entrepreneurs and business owners and big corporate types of businesses as well. Um, the end was not in sight. We didn't know how deep that was going to go. We didn't know how to deal with it because we hadn't dealt with something of that magnitude in a very, very long time. Now, I think there's some similarities to where we're at today um, from a, from a, market perspective, you're seeing the market actually come back up pretty quickly, the stock market. Um, and I think people's panic is, is certainly tamed in comparison because I, we've been through something before and we've all been um, able to bounce back from it. So I think a little bit more of a resiliency and optimism this time around compared to last, last go around in 2008, 2009. Yeah, I, I think I'd echo a lot of that, um, you know, the, the similarities being um, how much is unknown. Um, I'd say, you know, it seems also that the, one of the main differences in this current crisis is um, the employment sectors that are being impacted um, and how swiftly they were impacted. 2008 was a little bit of a um, kind of more slow rolling in terms of, of unemployment. Um, the other kind of distinction is I think, you know, 2008 was a bit more of a, of a man-made, if you will, um, economic crisis. Um, and this is much more, um, you know, there was no, um, even though I think there was, there were, we were, you know, we're 10 years out from the last crisis and the economy was booming and doing wonderfully. And there was a lot of speculation of, you know, when the next recession might occur, I don't think anybody could have said, oh, there's going to be a pandemic and that's what's going to cause it. Um, so, um, you know, it just kind of came on uh, very unexpectedly and um, is having different impacts. Um, but the, one of the similarities definitely is, is the unknown and how long we're going to be um, in this and, um, and how we're going to work our way out of it. Thank you both. Can you tell us a little bit about in the 0809 how you were affected, um, you know, by the the recession, and then how you worked your way out of it, or what challenges you faced and how you worked through them? So, what were kind of some of the strategies um, given your situation? Sure, I can I can uh, go on this one first. Um, I was really lucky when that uh, crisis hit, and that I actually had a job um, at the time, and I worked for the university, which is a wonderful place to to be working. Um, but I was also wrapping up my graduate degree, and I wanted to start working in the field that I had, you know, spent several years um, studying and wanted to get that career launched. And so, so I was fortunate to not. Um, you know, not be worrying about unemployment. Um, and, and I had a, had a job, but I also had to uh, go into the job market at a time when there was just so much, as we've said, so much uncertainty um, and just um, 
with unemployment going up, the, the, there was a lot more competition for the jobs that did become available. Um, so in terms of strategies and thinking, you know, how, um, how I was going to go out, out into this job market, um, I, I, I just knew that I needed to, to tap into my network around me and to my peers and my program um, at USD and, um, you know, let people just get out there and let people know that I was looking for, for work in the field and kind of, um, you know, in addition to my job searches, asking folks, you know, if you hear of anything, please let me know. Um, and ultimately, that was what ended up benefiting me was, was a peer in the program um, who worked for Senator Feinstein here in, in her San Diego district office was um, gra we were graduating the same year um, and she was going out to the DC office. So there was an opening in the San Diego office and, and I would have never otherwise um, found out about that, that job, but I was able to um, apply and, and you know, get that job and get started on the career path that I'm on now. So um, 2008, obviously a big challenge. Um, Age-wise, I think I'm a couple years younger than you, Alora. So <laughs> I was coming out with an undergrad degree, okay? And um, I'm, I was young for my grade, so I was 21 years old. With, um, I like to call it a little bit of life experience. I did the study broad, broad program at USD. That was a lot of fun, but really not a lot of career experience. And I had um, a job that I had worked part-time at USD. Um, I see the pictures of the, uh, the career fair booths and stuff. I remember I interned with a, a company and um, actually they hired me on for my senior year. So I had a little bit of work experience, but I was looking for a career. And similar to what Laura expressed, very tough work environment, a lot of competition with jobs. So I wasn't the smartest of my friends. You know, I graduated with a 3.0 average from USD, but I had my friends who were in the business program graduating with you know, really high GPAs with tax and finance and accounting emphasis. And, you know, they were resorting to working at, you know, bars and doing what they could to make money. And there's no shame in the game, but it was an opportunity for me to um, really look at what I wanted to do long term. And that's what I was forced to have those conversations is what do I want to be doing 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and not just a short term type of uh, conversation. So, that's how I was addressing the 08, 09 situation as I graduated from USD with an um, undergraduate degree. Um, thank you both. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and follow up on that. I mean, you mentioned the importance of networking, you know, leveraging the peer network, um, the study abroad program, et cetera. Um, looking back, is there anything that you think you would have done differently? You know, um, since 2008, 2009, we've had a lot of technological advancements, one of them being LinkedIn. And at that point in time, um, I believe it was in its infancy and wasn't widespread in terms of its usage. I did some networking on a personal basis with people that I knew, but I didn't really tap into the USD network. I kept close you know, talking points with my friends that I graduated with, but I didn't maximize my opportunities. So looking back, I would have been able to maximize more um, through my USD family. But fortunately, I did have some other relationships that helped me out quite a bit, but I would have definitely gone back and maximized that USD network a little bit more. Yeah, Tim, I think you're right. Uh, LinkedIn was brand new in 2008. Um, mm -hmm. I remember setting up my first LinkedIn um, uh, account or setting up my LinkedIn account at that time. Um, uh, yeah, things that, so I think definitely we have those new tools now, like the social networking and being able to co connect in those ways. Um, it's also a really interesting time right now with, you know, as we're navigating uh, the pandemic and everything as we're all here today has gone virtual. Um, we also have to figure out how to network over Zoom. And there's a lot of opportunities right now, like this one, where you can connect with these Zoom events are, are taking place um, pretty frequently. And I think it's a great place to, to connect with people, to um, follow fields that you're, you're interested in um, and you know, hear what's, what's happening in that field. Um, but back to the question of, of what I might have done differently at the time, um, I think I would have 
you know, if I could go back, I would have done a lot more volunteering um, in the field that I, you know, was trying to get into because that's a way to, in addition to the network that you have through um, through the school, to build a network in the career path that you're hoping to go down. And um, you know, I think that I, I I'm in the you know nonprofit government side of things. So there's a lot more opportunity. I don't know how frequent those types of opportunities come up in business, but even on the business side, you know. Um, there are a lot of people who work in business and are very philanthropic and very involved in, in nonprofit um, work. And so it's, it's a way to meet people and, and make connections um, and keep yourself busy. And it's, and it's another bullet on your resume. It looks great on your resume to have that, that extra, you know, volunteer work. That's very helpful. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. And in addition to the experience you, sh you just shared, is there any additional advice would you have for a recent graduate or new alumni navigating during this time? I would say um, the great opportunity to invest in yourself. Okay, invest in yourself. Um, Self-improvement, it could be formal where you go back to school or you take some courses locally or it could be informal where you go online and you take a course or you read a book or you you know involve yourself to improve your skills um, the networking is also you know a huge element which we've already talked about but i think self-improvement and being able to you know as a young student or a new graduate be proficient in holding a, a good professional conversation ask the right questions and be you know very presentable as you enter the job market because if opportunities are scarce you definitely want to be at the top of the list when it comes to interviewing well and showcasing yourself so i think that would be a great opportunity to take you know in today's challenging environment yeah i think um definitely we have the time right now to invest in in self-improvement and that's a really great um piece of advice um, but, you know, especially going back to this theme of kind of um, the unknown and, and how we're navigating through this time, just like we did back in 2008, 2009, you know, things are changing rapidly. And that means that with that comes actually some new opportunities. So thinking about what you want to do and where you want to go in your career, um, start kind of understanding how your field is going, you know, to take some time to, to understand how your field is being impacted by this crisis and what um, might be the new opportunities that come, come from that as we make, you know, changes to, um, you know, to, to adapt to society. So, you know, like right now, um, if I, you know, who would have ever thought that you might be able to have a pretty successful business making uh, facial coverings? But that's something that, you know, you can, that, that, that people need. And there's a whole, you know, a lot of other elements that go into something like that. You know, a business, there has to be, a, it's not just sewing a mask, there has to be shipping involved and, you know, some sort of uh, business management. Um, and then, you know, again, on the, the government and nonprofit side, uh, you know, my sector is really adapting and adjusting as well and how we are addressing um, the needs of of our missions um, and how we how we make those changes to to keep doing the work um, in the in the current climate. So just being really uh, aware of of what's changing and and how your field is 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 adapting. You put you ahead. You know, uh, on top of that, you know, great points, Laura. And, and I would say, um, you know, I've, I'm in a very entrepreneurial field where um, there's no restrictions for who I work with. And, you know, as long as it's abiding by laws and regulations that are set forth, um, there's, it's, it's an open enterprise. And I would say that coming out of college, graduating USD, I didn't really know what I was looking for. I was thinking, I, I thought I was looking for a job. Um, now, this is an opportunity if you have a dream and you're young and you want to go out there and take a little bit of risk from an entrepreneurial standpoint, not a bad time to go ahead and consider what that looks like and what that could do for you. Because if it doesn't work out, gosh darn, okay, you're still in your early 20s, mid 20s, and you have a lifetime and a career ahead of you. So good opportunity to take a look at a risk reward entrepreneurial um, route. 
and evaluate what that may be able to provide, you know, for someone as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, Laura, you touched on this a little bit. Um, great segue. But can you talk a little bit about when you think of the skills or abilities someone might need or could work on during this time if they're thinking a career in government or policy, what that might look like? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, um, it's understanding not only the stuff that you learn in school, like the systems of, you know, how, how a bill becomes a law and those kind of like very fundamental skills, but also like honing in on, on something that you want to do, in, like in terms of policy or nonprofit government work is that, it, you know, like I work in, in housing policy. And so I spend a lot of time um, I'm on Twitter all the time, learn, you know, hearing what the what the latest um, housing policy news is out of Sacramento. Um, but like honing in on something that you really want to focus on in in government or policy. Do you want to go into public health? Do you want to go into, um, you know, there's a whole lot of talk, especially right now. I mean, talk about it, things that we're adapting to, uh, child care. You know, these are these are big public um, challenges that we are. A, a trying to, to address right now um, and kind of honing in on finding what you like and learning as much about it and learning who those leaders are and going back to that that networking piece is you know don't be afraid to to reach out to somebody um, it, that that you might not know but might be a leader in your field like uh, an example I think of is, is I mean talk about something that that I, I didn't do that I wish I had was when I graduated from USD and I knew I wanted to, you know, kind of get involved. I wanted to start this career in, in public policy in, in one way or another. Um, and somebody recommended, why don't you reach out to Todd Gloria, who at the time was a city council member, um, you know, here in the city of San Diego, but he was a USD alum. And I, I started an email to his, you know, his city government uh, email address. And I just got so nervous because I was like, why is a council member going to want to talk to somebody he's never met, you know, and, and I never I ended up never sending the email. And now, you know, here it is 10 years later and Todd Gloria is an assembly member um, and he's, he's running for mayor of the city. And, you know, I talk with him frequently about housing policy. Um, and I could have made that connection so much earlier on. I, I knew he would have been a good resource. Um, and I just was, I kind of like held myself back. Um, but I would say, you know, um, find, find what you want to do, find who those people are that are um, out there doing what you kind of would dream of and make those connections and, and learn from them and, um, and build your network up. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'd say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. And um, Tim, what are the key skills um, for the financial industry and how is your industry currently being affected? Sure. So um, key skills, it's a really interesting question because people will look at my resume or, or look at what we do and think that, oh, I've got to be really good at math. I've got to be a numbers person. I've got to be an analytical person. Realistically, in today's day and age, that work that the analytics, those behind the scenes things, if you're in my role working with clients, advising them on what steps to take to become more organized financially for the future, it's actually really a skill set that is involving emotional intelligence because all of the back office work, the numbers, the analysis, that kind of stuff is already done. Thankfully for me, I mentioned I'm you know, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I know how to talk to someone and hold a really good conversation. And so emotional intelligence, being able to see when someone's uncomfortable, reading their visual you know, body language or hearing in their voice when something really hits and drives home with them in terms of what bothers them or excites them with their finances. And so emotional intelligence, that's the skills that CEOs at top Fortune 100, top Fortune 500 companies, they have. They've got a great team. Okay, and I don't want to get in a political conversation, but the president has a team of advisors. So he's already got the information. It's more about how, what to do with that information, what questions and what route to take once that information is known. That's emotional intelligence and that's really a top skill set that I employ on a day to day basis because I'm in a front facing client relationship type of business that revolves around money. 
um, as far as the how our industry was affected, we're not immune. Uh, obviously, you know, I get a lot of calls from clients, you know, concerned. Um, our revenue is down. We're seeing people stay off on the sidelines rather than jumping in, you know, because they're scared. Um, but that actually, from a career standpoint, it's a great opportunity for someone to get into our career. And what the tough times do in our business is usually there's a shakeout of advisors who are on the lower end of the quality spectrum. So you start to see the top advisors, the cream rises to the top. So you'll see that in, in a deep recession or some sort of economic event like this, you'll start to see the top advisors rising out. And, um, you know, what I would say is the opportunity to strengthen relationships. That's what I learned from 2008, 2009. I didn't have any clients at that point in time. So it's all about the relationships and the communication that I was starting with people. And now that we're sort of doing this whole cycle again, that's definitely something that I'm continuing to leverage and do with my current clients and existing relationships and new ones as well. Thank you. Um, can you please recommend maybe two or three action steps for job seekers to move toward their professional goals? I would say um, a couple steps, you know, as I mentioned before, networking is, is big. Um, USD has also stepped up their networking game by working with different platforms and programs that they've integrated and the Career Center and, and Dee and her team have really been pushing and it's for the right reasons. So the team platform, uh, Handshake was something that's also been helpful. And again, um, networking just with general USD alum because I'm a Torero, I'll take a call any day from a Torero, you know, and I think a lot of people fortunately within our network have the same feeling. So um, networking is one, again, self-improvement in this time, you know, read a, read a book. Um, Simon Sinek is an author that's a great author when it comes to business and just general motivation. Um, invest in yourself with the, you know, emotional intelligence that I mentioned earlier. And, you know, maybe take an opportunity to sample or talk to people in different career paths. If you thought you were an accounting major, maybe go talk to someone that was outside of the accounting world just to get a flavor for what's out there, because you may end up having some likes or dislikes based on those discussions and those opportunities. So I'd say go, with, go broaden the relationships as well. I'd say, um, you know, now is a good time also to be to be really um, kind of flexible and nimble. You know, you're going out into the career field. field. Tim, you gave an example of accounting, and I think most people, when they think of accounting, they think of a huge firm like maybe Price Waterhouse Coopers or whatever. But you know, nonprofits need bookkeepers and account accountants too. Um, so, and, and you know. And nonprofit and government work tends to actually, we are not immune to the impact of a crisis like this. Fundraising gets very difficult. Uh, government revenues are, are going to go down, but it, it tends to be what sticks around through a crisis because they're usually, you know, responding to the greatest needs of a crisis. Um, so, um, I, you know, that's just a little pitch for, for nonprofit government work, but um uh, but, you know, being flexible and thinking, you know, back to the, the whole thing of that we're in this crisis and we don't, we have all these unknowns, things are changing and things are adapting, um, be willing to kind of think the same way um, and, and be flexible. Um, I, I don't know how much I could add uh, in addition to what Tim rec recommended. Uh, Simon Sinek is a great uh, kind of motivational um, uh, speaker, and I actually was able to see him speak one of the last things I did before this pandemic. Um, I had some really great books that kind of, I think, can help you think about that emotional intelligence and think about um, getting motivated. Um, I think maybe, you know, self-reflection, thinking about, you know, taking that time to to go on a hike and think about what you want to be doing in five years, what you want to be doing in 10 years, and how you think you're going to get there. Um, and believing in yourself. I mean, that's, 
I think one of the the biggest challenges is at a time when we're we're going through so much uncertainty is like, you know, it can be hard to think about starting a career when careers are are hard to come by or jobs are hard to come by. But believe in yourself. Know that you know you've been studying for this. You want to do this, and you know you this is what you're meant to do. And go out and and pursue it and do it. You know, on, on top of that, Laura. Um you know, talking about pursuit of these types of goals and endeavors, you know, some, there's two ways that you can look at a situation like this is some people want to just wait it out and okay, I'll wait and see how this is going to pan out and, and I'll address things when they get better. Or some people are trying to look at the silver lining and look for those opportunities. You know, as, as a new college grad, I would be aggressive. I would go out there and really look at this as an opportunity to establish yourself and, you know, get experience, whether it's the ultimate career field that you see yourself or not, be aggressive because sitting and waiting around generally doesn't help a whole bunch. Um, so I would say go out, you know, go interview, get a flavor for what's out there and in different industries, for-profit, non-profit, I think that's great. Um, you know, and, and see how you can help other people too, because being a go-giver is going to be something that's a wonderful attribute, not only in times like they are now, but for the future. So the more that you can be a go-giver to somebody else, they that's good karma. You know, I'm a big believer in karma, whether it's personal or business karma, it will come back around. So I think that's a big opportunity to also see how you can lend a helping hand to somebody else. Um. Tim, just as follow up to that, I mean, you mentioned the importance of investing um, in ourselves. Are there any particular online tools, resources that either you or Laura can recommend um, for skills building and self improvement? You know what? I think um, it starts with a good self awareness, um, a great tool to diagnose your yourself first. Is go and uh, purchase the Strengths Finder book. I think it's probably less than twenty dollars. If you guys have heard of it, great. If you haven't, it's a very insightful and very accurate type of um, self-assessment tool. So there's some literature, it's a small book, and then you go and you take a personality test and it'll highlight your strengths and highlight your weaknesses. And it's more about, for me, at least from my perspective, augmenting your strengths, taking those to the next level, and then seeing how you can complement your weaknesses either by delegating or having someone else being able to compensate for those weaknesses because everybody on this call has spent dozens of years evolving into the person that you are today, literally from a DNA perspective. I don't want to try to change that because that's going to be hard to do. In fact, look at your strengths, look at where you're really good at, maximize those and then complement the weaknesses. So strength finders is a really nice opportunity to identify what those are from a starter perspective. And then that could get your thought process going from there in terms of how can I maximize this? What industry, what type of role would be good? You know, it's not the be all end all, but it's a good starting point. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, for all the students and alumni out there, you can take the strengths assessment with us and we're more than happy to help you with the assessments uh, for free. So I just wanted to throw it out there for all of our participants who might be interested. That's great. Um, a question that, that came Sorry, Laura. Sorry, I was just going to add you for the for tools that you know um, that I could recommend. Um, I think that when you're thinking about going, you know, and having interviews, you're going to be talking with people who are higher up in leadership positions, and you want to, you know, you want to present that you are um, up to date and knowledgeable. And so, one of the basic things that you can do is have a newspaper subscription. Um, and read the news every day and read about things. And this is also going to help you understand where those like hidden gems and opportunities might be um, because you might learn about something that's happening that you're interested in that you didn't really know about. Um, but I'd say staying, staying current on um, what's happening in the world and, and at the local level um, is a tool that, uh, that everyone should have access to and um, that helps prepare you uh, as you go out and, and make more connections, build those relationships and um, go off on your career uh, path. Thank you. And if you're a current USD student, most of the large newspapers you can get online through the library for free as well. So keep that in mind. 
Um, Laura and Tim, a question that came in that um, I'll throw to both of you and then um, D. Alex or I can give our opinion too is continuing your education. So, you know, with the economy being um, where it is at the moment, is going back to school something people should be considering um, in hopes that when they're done with school, um, the market might look a little different. So I know career development has some thoughts on that, but I'll throw it to both of you first. I want to um, I want to answer the question as diplomatically as possible because I believe there is yes that is a good option and then no that is also not a good option. I think if you are on a career path where you're going to want an advanced degree, whether it be an MBA or go to the law school or go to the nursing school, if that's something that you're going to want to do, then I think if that's an option, great better job market might be available once you complete that curriculum, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, however long it might be. Now, personally, I, this is just me personally, I don't think you have to go necessarily re-enroll back in school if you just don't have anything else to do. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're weighing both options. I believe strongly that it could further your career. I've seen it done many times before. You just want to make sure it's for the right reasons. So I believe that um, it's a great question because I know a lot of people are asking themselves right now, do I go back to school? So um, individual consideration for sure. Yeah, I think in addition to knowing if, you're, if your path or your goal requires that specific higher ed degree is definitely um, a good thing to think about. Um, but also thinking about um, being you know making sure that you know what you want is important and if if you if you're not sh sure you're not certain then it might be a good idea to mention to kind of hold off and um and explore the the jobs in your field before you go back to school you two nailed it on the head so thank you great answers Any other questions from any um, of our participants for Laura, Tim, Alex, D or I? So let me add a little bit about uh, continuing education. When you apply to graduate programs, you need to write an application essay. And one of the first questions they're gonna ask you is, what's your career or academic goal? And how does our program going to help you toward that goal? So if you're not sure what you want and you don't have a very clear, a career design or maybe academic career in mind and you won't be able to write a strong application to begin with and if you have been seriously considering graduate education as a part of your career design and maybe the job market accelerate that uh, your plan and uh, if you, you do so purposefully intentionally and I don't think there's anything wrong about it but if you just try to wait it out because job market is bad right now and you just want to get back to school to wait for a better job market um, I think like Tim and Laura mentioned earlier, that if you're not being purposeful about your intention about graduate school, it's probably not necessarily a good plan at this time. And we have a question uh, for Laura. How necessary do you think a higher ed degree is uh, for policy work? It kind of depends. Um, you know, I work with people in policy who only have bachelor's degrees, and I work with, with people in policy who have law degrees. Um, and I think that it, the years of experience in policy add up, and, and the, the um, higher education, the higher degree is not as important but early on having um, a higher degree to start out with can give you a little bit more of a competitive edge um, that said so can things like demonstrating years of, of involvement or having volunteered um, being able to actually demonstrate real life experience um, can can help if you're if you don't have that higher education degree. So, so it kind of depends, um, and it depends on where you want to go in policy work. You know, I, I don't have a law degree. Um, I work with a lot of lawyers, um, but I think that there would be some barriers for me um, if in jobs that I might want to pursue because I don't have a law degree. Um, 
so it just kind of depends on what you want to do, how, how high up you want to go, um, what specifically you want to do, um, and how quickly you want to get there. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and she says it was very helpful. So thank you, thank you both. Um, I have a quick question. Um, can you let our listeners know um, what a typical day looks like for both of you, both pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? Sure, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great um, compare and contrast, D. So um, look, on a daily basis, what I do is I meet with my team here internally, the other advisors that are on my team, and I also speak with current and prospective clients. So that has not changed. It's the tone, it's the, um, everything is amplified now. So any concern that was existing before is now amplified. Anybody wanting to um, invest money, you know, they're seeing either the desire or the lack of desire to do so, you know, is amplified. So I think that the day to day is, is very much the same. Now the conversations in terms of the intensity and the need for at least what I do in my world has become that much more um, of a focus because people who are not organized or not prepared on a financial perspective, it was a little bit of a wake up call that they need to have the right amount of savings that they can access, that they're saving money just in general, that they're allocating the right amount of money to the retirement programs and they've got the right insurances. So I think it was a wake up call from the day-to-day -day conversations that I was having with my clients and prospective clients to say, hey, look, you know, some crazy stuff has happened this year. We wanna make sure that we're organized. You're seeing a lot of that go on right now from a day-to-day -day conversations. It's generally a couple hours of internal meetings and conversations per day, and probably three to four hours worth of client and prospective client conversations per day with a little bit of follow-up and admin work. To, to round it out. So um, pretty balanced. I try to keep some regular habits. That's how I stay sane, you know, in my world, <laughs> because there's a lot of new things, which is great. It keeps me on my toes, but you don't want to be dragged in so many different directions. So keeping those habits and a consistent schedule is, you know, something for me that's very um, necessary to run a, a, you know, an efficient business. Um, so a typical day for me pre-pandemic um, usually involves um, going to a lot of meetings, having a lot of phone calls. Um, I, you know, usually was either uh, watching online through streaming a state legislative hearing or I would be down at City Hall um, at a city council hearing to, to speak on whatever item was coming through council that day that, you know, my organization might want to be weighing in on. And, um, you know, so it's just a lot of running around, uh, you know, that, that relationship building, staying connected to people. Um, and then the pandemic hit and um, things changed rather quickly. Um, and it was all of a sudden everyone was working from home. Uh, the legislative hearings weren't happening. Um, those like coffee meetings and lunch meetings were off the table. Um, and so it was, it was, kind of strange for the first month, I'd say, uh, first couple of weeks of, like, I had so much more time to actually do the work that I need to sit or, you know, sit down, the writing I have to do, the reading I have to do for analysis and, and things like that. And so I, it felt like, you know, I'd, I'd get so much done in the day. And I was like, wow, this is, this is such an interesting shift. Um, and, and then, you know, um, legislative hearings weren't happening. So, you know, there was, like, it, it was just, a complete like upside down from what I was used to and then um, we all kind of started getting used to it and and figuring out how to navigate the situation that we're in um, while doing the things that we did before so instead of you know a coffee or a lunch date at you know a, a, a restaurant or a coffee shop with a, with a friend or a colleague it would be you know let's meet up over zoom or let's have a phone call um, people are getting can can get a little bit zoomed out. So um, just, you know, having those phone calls to, to stay connected. Um, the legislative hearings picked up again. Um, it's, it's been just so, um, such an, a wild experience for me to have gone from, you know, being down at City Hall, you know, dressed in my 
business attire to to go you know give my public uh, comment at a hearing and now I do I, they they have you call in and so I just I'm, you know I'm, I'm sitting here in my home calling in I can't see the council members when I'm speaking um, it's a it's a whole different thing but it's just that adaptability and being ad able to adapt um, to change um, you know at my typical day before d involved dropping my kids off at preschool and now they're here with me and you all saw them what my three-year-old come in and interrupt and so working from home with kids is a is a whole other dynamic um, but the elements of, of what of the work that um, I have to do, you know, stay the same. It's it's staying connected. It's staying um, on top of uh, of the policy discussions. It's keeping track of what's happening with the state budget. Staying uh, in contact with my um, colleagues and friends up in Sacramento. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 become the same stuff, just a different setting and a different platform. And um, that adaptability is key. Thank you for that. Um, do you uh, do our listeners have any questions? Please, please feel free to choose, send them to us via chat, or you're more than welcome to unmute yourselves and um, ask directly to our speakers. So before we wrap up, let me take a moment just to share our uh, career resources. And if you want to, whether you're an undergraduate student or graduate student or alumni, um, you need a little bit of support in your job search, you want to make a one-on-one -on -one appointment, uh, our career coaches are available virtually. And also, uh, we have online resources to help you with your job search. And uh, I would recommend at least start uh, by checking our Handshake platform, if you have not done so. Handshake is our job board, and every week there are about 500 new jobs posted, uh, full-time job posted, and uh, also our team platform. Networking came up several times in the, in the conversation. This team platform um, is a Toro employer and alumni mentoring program, and more than uh, how, how many, D right now there are about 3,000 alumni volunteer to be mentoring there. They volunteer to be there to connect with you and to support you. And so um, please give it a try if you have not done so yet. And uh, if you go to our webpage, uh, sandiego.edu careers, you will also be able to find uh, online career resources like, um, like a resume samples, cover letter guide, interview guide, and also we have a page dedicated to the resources specifically for a job search under COVID-19 impact. Alex, thanks so much for that. Um, yes, and for our alumni employers out there, you can also post um, advanced career opportunities um, on the team networking platform. And as Alex mentioned, we have over 3,000 um, Teros uh, who you can connect with. Um, I have one follow-up question uh, for our guest speakers before we wrap up, and that is um, for those of our listeners who are interested in careers with the Housing um, Federation or with Capstone Financial Partners, what are your top three hiring criteria? No criminal background, <laughs> start there. Um, but on a serious note, um, hiring criteria is we always look at degree and of course, I think that's a, a, an assumption with a lot of the people on this call here today. So that's, that's good. And, um, you know, we've got lots of interesting people, D and, and the team here who come to, to us with different backgrounds. So it's actually, I look at it from a fit. I want to see if it's going to be a good fit with somebody in our business to make sure it's the right career path for them. So you know, what I look forward to is having those conversations to figure out if it's, you know, a good fit for someone long term in this career. And one of the things that we've, we've got several tools and assessment um, modules that we use to make sure that that's a good fit. And it's a lot of one on one conversations as well. So really, it's not so much of a, you have to come to the table with X, Y and Z qualifications. Um, as long as somebody, you know, has a good background generally, and then the fit in the long term types of goals are aligned. That's what we're looking for here at Capstone. Yeah, um, the Housing Federation is a pretty small nonprofit. So we, um, uh, you know, don't often have a lot of, uh, of 
positions to fill, but when we do, at least on the policy side, you know, what I have looked for is um, I really like to see that that there is some, at least some experience, and it doesn't have to be formal, you know, um, paid paid work, but but to see like even a brief internship or volunteering on a campaign, um, something related to the work that that we're doing, um, connected to the work that we're doing is really helpful. Um, and then uh, a cover letter, a really great cover letter is, is a game changer. I have, I have not even considered um, a potential candidate if I don't see a cover letter. If you're not taking the time to explain to me why you want this position, it tells me that you're probably not as interested in it as as one should be right um alex you mentioned like how if you're applying to grad school and you don't know why you want to go that's going to become very evident the same thing with a job write that cover letter so that somebody you're a potential employer can see why they should take the time to interview you taking the time to interview people is a lot of work it's a lot of time and and you know, people make decisions of whether or not uh, to take the time to do that based on on what they can see from a person. So a strong cover letter is really helpful. And then, yeah, it's, as Tim mentioned, definitely the the fit. Um, knowing a little bit about um, the 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 organization, the company, going into an interview um, is really helpful because then you can demonstrate what you know a little bit about what they're all about. And um, I think that at least in my experience the current workplace has shifted further away from a a hierarchical structure to more of a collaborative teamwork environment and so being able to demonstrate to a potential employer that you can be a member of a team that you can uh, work with others and um, and frankly at least in in my organization that you're going to be you know a good person to be around. We're, like I said, small team, small office. Like we spend a lot of time with our coworkers, at least in normal times. Um, and, and, you know, you, you want that person to be somebody who's, who's pleasant and, and it doesn't mean that you have everything in common with them, but, um, but that they, they're, you know, they're going to be um, positive, optimistic. Um, and those are the things that you really need uh, the, 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 um, not the skills, but the assets that you really need to be a, a, a team um, team player anyway. So, um, yeah, write that cover letter. Thank you so much. And Tim, uh, do you require strong cover letters as well? You know, um, I, I frequently use LinkedIn as a just a reference point. You know, I, I no longer collect resumes. Um, you know, I use LinkedIn just as an easy reference point, you know, a strong cover letter to me tells someone that they really are engaged, that they've taken the time and that this is a serious matter. So I think is it required? No, but it absolutely tells me something ahead of time in terms of how serious someone is looking at the opportunity and how intent they are. So I believe that if you want to make a strong case for yourself, whether it's with my firm or any, you know, career, just as Laura mentioned, it's going to behoove you to show someone to stand out from the crowd, especially in an environment like this, that you're special, that you really take this seriously, and that you really want to have an engaging conversation regarding the career path, if that's the discussion at hand. I think it would not hurt whatsoever. Thank you, Bo. Well, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you have additional questions, um, feel free to hang out for a moment or two and Dee and Alex and I are happy to answer those. Um, and we encourage you to make an appointment with a career counselor if you wanna kind of come up with a strategy that best fits your needs um, for your job search during this time. But we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Um, and again, Laura and Tim, thank you so much for your time um, and your generosity in giving that to us.